it's easy to to vilify bats as strange or scary or disease vectors. But the truth about bats reveals remarkable adaptations, feats of superb athletic ability, and stories of caring parents. We also find that healthy bat populations, such as those found at Bracken Cave in Texas, are important for the health and well-being of humanity as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. We have about 190 cameras all over the world, so there's always something to watch. Right now, however, we're talking about bats, specifically Mexican free-tailed bats at Bracken Cave, which is home to the world's largest bat colony. Explore.org hosts two cams at Bracken Cave, and the season for its famed bat flights has just begun. To help us learn more, I'm joined by Fran Hutchins, the director of Bat Cave Preserve, or, excuse me, Bracken Cave Preserve with Bat Conservation International. Fran, uh, so uh, great to have you along today to to learn about bats with you. I'm, I'm really excited for our conversation. Mike, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, we got a beautiful sunny day here in uh, the Texas Hill Country, just outside of San Antonio. And if you are watching at home or no matter where you happen to be around the world, if you have questions for Fran about bats, this is a wonderful opportunity to uh, get him to answer those. So drop those in the chats, no matter where you happen to be watching. And we'll do our best to try to answer a few of those as we head along. Uh, Fran, I, I want to maybe start out just with a basic question about the organization that you work for, Bat Conservation International. It does a lot of really great work around the world, uh, but maybe you can talk more specifically about what your organization does. Right. So Bat Conservation International has been around for uh, about 42 years now. Uh, we're headquartered in Austin, Texas, and uh, there's 53 of us spread out all over the world and working, uh, doing research, uh, restoration projects at different caves, for example, in Jamaica, Tahiti, Rwanda, uh, all over the U.S. as well, Mexico. So lots of very dedicated staff uh, researching bats and, and talking with uh, people and landowners to try to uh, save our bats all over the world and, and educate people on how um, great they are and why we need them. And as I mentioned before, you're the director of Bat Conservation International's Bracken Cave Preserve in Texas. And this is home to the largest colony of bats on earth. Millions of Mexican free tail bats use it in spring, summer, and fall. In fact, the cave entrance I can see is right behind you. Uh, so you have just a, a wonderful background in mind. I'm not actually in the cave. This is just a screenshot from the webcam behind <laughs> me. Uh, so I, I want to know, maybe you can tell us more about the cave. What, what, um, you know, what's the landscape uh, surrounding it like and what makes the cave itself so inviting to Mexican free tail bats? Well, Bracken Cave Preserve is just outside of San Antonio, Texas. We're about 20 miles from downtown San Antonio in what we call the Texas Hill Country. It's a 1,500-acre preserve. It's uh, more or less represents the uh, hill country here in Texas. And it's real important, not just because of the Mexican free tail bats that call it home, but it's also part of the recharge zone for our aquifer. So the geology that you see here around me and the sinkhole and the caves are all part of the recharge zone. It's where San Antonio gets its drinking water. We're also important habitat for an endangered migratory songbird, the golden chick warbler, which lives in Central America, flies up here to the Texas Hill Country um, in March and it's here till June and having its baby. So we're right in the middle of golden chick warbler uh, breeding season. Uh, so that's really exciting for us as well. So, and then we this whole landscape is um, a ash juniper uh, woodland mix of oak, juniper, uh, per persimmon, lots of different uh, types of plants and animals that call this preserve a uh, home right here in San Antonio. It sounds wonderful. I've never been to that area to explore. Um, I'd love to get there maybe one day. And I love persimmons too. They're one of the best wild fruits that you can <laughs> you can taste. <laughs> it's hard to, it, nothing really compares with a wild uh, and imperfectly ripe persimmon. So if you haven't tried it, uh, if anyone's watching and wants to, and you have that opportunity, I would certainly recommend it. And I, I want to talk more about the cave environment 
in the life of the bats inside the cave soon. But, but uh, before we get there, let's maybe introduce the Mexican free-tailed uh, bat itself. Uh, bats are an exceptionally diverse group of mammals. Uh, they are only outnumbered by rodents in the number of species found on Earth. So let's maybe narrow down the focus a little bit. What defines or is most distinctive about Mexican free-tailed bats? Well, when you look, <clears throat> if you look at a picture of a Mexican free-tailed bat, the um, they're about as big uh, big as my two thumbs together. So they're, uh, they weigh about 15 grams. And their tail sticks out beyond the wing membrane, the tail membrane. So that, they're part of that free tail species of bat. Um, they're migratory. So they migrate from Mexico, all over Mexico, uh, to the Texas Hill Country uh, to have their babies. Uh, the migration starts in late February, early June. Uh, we have our start having babies. Uh, I'm sorry, the migration starts in uh, late February, early March, we start having babies in early June uh, here in at the at the cave. So this is a maternity roost for these Mexican pretail bats. And I was I was surprised to learn that uh, much of their hunting takes place thousands of feet above the earth. Uh, we see them flying out of the cave, uh, but they they make nightly long distance flights. They fly at high speeds. Uh, one study I read found uh, uh, Mexican free-tail bats um, many thousands of feet uh, in the atmosphere feeding. Uh, so it's perhaps easy to get the impression that bats, uh, including Mexican free-tail bats, are, are, aren't are strong flyers uh, and they make their living somewhat close to the ground. Uh, but what has the, the last few decades of research taught us about the hunting and flying capabilities of Mexican free-tail bats? Yeah, they're one of the most long distance flyers that we have. So every night when they go out to forage for food, they're heading at at least 60 miles one way. And they'll also forage for food up to 10,000 feet in altitude. Their favorite food are a lot of our agricultural pests. So your corn or worm moth, your cotton bowl worm moth, those are pretty large moths uh, that feed, you know, lay their eggs on the crops that we have here in, uh, in South Texas, Central Texas. So they, when they, spiral out of the cave and start flying down range. They'll use thermals uh, to get up to different altitudes. Just depends on the time of the year and where the insects are because those insects are also migrating through the area as they lay their eggs on the crops, they hatch out, feed, and then we get more more babies become adults. And, and then these large concentration of insects move from one set of crops to another and they actually march all the way through Texas and the, <clears throat> and the, up into southern Canada throughout the summer. So these bats are out there foraging on these uh, these insects. And what's really cool is if you, and no matter where you are, you can pull up a Doppler site and zoom into the Texas Hill Country. And you can see all these uh, clouds forming over these bat roosts as the bats come out to feed every night. So it's really cool to watch these um, plumes of bats start popping up all over the Texas Hill Country um, in the evenings. Right now, that starts happening around 7.50, 8 o'clock in the evening uh, these days. <clears throat> so we're, we're learning more about you know the, the ecology of bats, the behavior of bats when they're out foraging. Uh, how can this knowledge inform us as we work to better protect bat populations? Well, some of our insects, so these are insectivores. These bats that we have here um, are eating bugs. In fact, tonight they're going to eat over 150 tons of bugs. So that's one of the reasons that's so important to the local farmers that we have. <clears throat> so, but so, so some of our bats are catching insects while they're flying. Uh, other species of bats are what we call gleamers. They can hunt down and find insects that are eating or living on the leaves and the plants and just pluck them off in the dark uh, with a combination of their echolocating and their very good hearing. Those two things mixed together and their eyesight, they can find those bugs that are on plants and just pluck them right off. So those insect eating bats um, are real important uh, because of all, you know, basically all their, that natural pest control that we have. And a, a, maybe a follow-up question to that came in from one of our uh, 
one of our audience uh, members right now, or one of our viewers, who was wondering about how we can protect urban bat populations. Uh, Bracken Cave is a natural feature, but uh, I think maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, in Austin, Texas, there's a very large population of Mexican free-tailed bats that roost under a bridge uh, that people can see every night. So we have like, uh, you know, a, a, an animal like a bat that's adaptable enough to maybe use um, human structures. What, how, what, you know, maybe, yeah, just getting back to the basic question, uh, is there information that we can use or how can we better protect, uh, you know, urban bat populations along with the wild ones? Well, if you go to our website, batcon.org, you can get lots of information about different bat species all over the world um, and the, the research that we're doing and also um, things that you can do to help bats. So in the urban, in these urban environments, the Mexican free-tailed bats have adapted to, so they'll re, uh, roost in bridges, uh, uh, certain type style uh, designed bridges, like the one in, uh, in uh, Austin. Uh, they re, uh, roost in the expansion joints along those expansion joints. Uh, trees with the palm trees have the dead palm fronds hanging down. Uh, there's four different species of bats that'll roost in those layers of palm fronds. Mexican free tails are one. Our evening bats, our yellow bats, uh, will also roost in those layers of palm fronds. Um, old dead trees, um, the tree cavities. Uh, a lot of the bat species that we have in these urban environments don't nest don't because we don't have a lot of caves in these urban environments. Don't actually roost in caves. They'll roost in uh, tree cavities or where the bark starts pulling away from a, from a dead tree, they'll roost up in those layers between the bark and the tree trunk. Um, a lot of our species of bats are also more solitary. So they're literally just hanging from the, the trees. They look like dead leaves. Um, we can't even tell that they're uh, up there in the trees, just hanging there with the leaves. I like our Eastern red bats. Um, are up in there in the trees and, and they're a big bug eaters as well. So it sounds like, uh, you know, one of the ways that we can maybe best protect bats is, is just ensuring that they have these variety of habitats to utilize. Is that a fair uh, assessment? Yes. And most of our species, uh, the Mexican free tail bats are, are kind of unique as far as the distance that they travel to forage for food, 60 miles. But most species of bats are only roosting I mean, foraging for food within a few miles of their roost. Uh, so they need that roosting space, like a tree cavity. And of course, then they need the bugs that are in the area. So one of the things that you can do is um, put in what we call a bat garden, which we've got information on our website about bat gardens. Uh, and so those uh, bat gardens, you got plants that, that bloom, have flowers that bloom at night or attract moths, a lot of your grasses. Uh, and so that's food for bats as well. And then the added benefit to us is that same food that the bats are eating, birds and other uh, animals will eat those in, uh, those insects during the day and, and the plants are flowering. So you get that all that nice little ecosystem can be going on in your backyard and it's just something fun to watch and relax next to. Um, Small uh, bodies of water, because bats, when to get water, they drink, they fly over that water source and lap it up or gulp it up. So they're drinking while they're flying. So small little bodies of water uh, help bats as well. <clears throat> and getting back to Mexican free tail bats, they are an echolocating species. So they use that to navigate, avoid obstacles, find food, as you mentioned. And while that's an mm -hmm. amazing adaptation, the uh, I, I was reading recently that the acoustic life of Mexican free-tailed bats is even more complex than that. Uh, the <coughs> males of this species actually sing, for example. So what what might be the purpose of of songs uh, from male Mexican free-tailed bats? Well, yeah. So for our Mexican free-tailed bats, the uh, echolocation, which is at a fre high enough frequency we can't hear. Um, but they also do have some chirps and clicks that they use to communicate with each other that actually we can hear. And the males have a song that they sing that attracts females for when they're mating. So, uh, so that's why the males have that song that, that to sing and attract the females during the during mating when they're mating. And I think we have the audio of one song um, from a, from a bat. This was recorded. Uh, 
from a study titled <clears throat> Versatility and, and Stereotypy of Freetail Bat Songs. It was published in 2009 in the journal Plus One. And it's um, it's open access too. So if you look that up, you get some really cool information on this. Uh, but the, the video was slowed down about eight times its normal speed from what a bat would normally do. But I, I want to, I have a follow-up question for you, Fran, after we listen to this. So yeah, Candace, if you can cue that up. So that that was uh, you know, again a, a song from a male Mexican free tail bat. I, I could hear in that Fran different um, series of notes. Um, they were arranged differently. So is there? Uh, it seems like from the paper I read, uh, and maybe you can explain more that there's there is some logic for the bat uh, in the way that they happen to arrange their songs and make um, those certain like chips and and, and jitters. Right. Yeah. I mean, like it's it's their own little language that they use these chirps and, and chitters and uh, squeaks kind of what sounds like a squeak to us for the, for them to communicate uh, where they are, who they are um, to attract uh, another female uh, to them as well. Also, these are roosting groups. So you're looking at, for example, we have uh, eight to 10 million bats in the cave right now that are, you know, going to have babies in a little while. And you, when you have that many, uh, bats in one place, uh, it's, uh, the colony is made, this big colony is made up of thousands of smaller colonies that have migrated here together and are roosting together. So that communication is, you know, what they use to, for the space that they're roosting in. Also, when they're going to go out to forage for food. Uh, they when they start start their nightly emergence from the cave, uh, it's that way they they basically stay together as groups uh, when they're out foraging. Oh, fascinating! I, I did not know that. Uh, and it, you know that that's maybe I guess gets to my next question too, uh, because some bats are, are, are you know can be difficult to observe their behaviors, mm -hmm. um, a lot of their. Uh, their vocalizations, their echolocations, we cannot hear very well or at all. So do you think that our inability as humans to experience life of bats or perceive sort of their world through their eyes has led to misunderstandings about their lives and role in nature and maybe even their overall importance to ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, most, most, you know, bats, of course, are out foraging for food at night um, and they can see and hear very well in the dark. We can't. Um, so a lot of times we don't even know that they're flying around. We may get glints of them like around a street light uh, as they're collect catching bugs around a street light or something like that. But but for the most part, mo we don't. Most of us don't have any experience or uh, uh, or so uh, interaction with bats. Um, so they created a lot of myths about bats. For example, one of them is a lot of people think bats are blind because they're flying around at night. And they're not. None of our over 1,400 species are blind. They all have uh, very good eyesight. So it's a combination of echolocating and good eyesight that helps them navigate the environment and, and to get around. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people think that um, bats will get in your hair when they're fluttering and flying around, um, but they don't. They don't eat hair and they don't want to be in your hair. They're just flying around trying to, to catch a bug. Uh, but not having any, basically don't want to have anything to do with this. So those are just a couple of the myths that we have out there about bats. So let's let's talk more about like the the cave life of of Mexican free tail bats. Their their life in the cave and their roosting behavior might be one of the more accessible portions of their lives, at least for people. What we can observe mm -hmm. uh, for the bats, importantly, it's one of the most consequential. Uh, we did have an audience question that I think might be good to answer right now. It's basically just kind of like a general question, but um, maybe you could just uh, answer it real quick. Uh, somebody was wondering, how many bats is that? So could you just, uh, again, uh, tell us about the the numbers of bats that inhabit Bracken Cave? So um, this time of the year, as the bats migrate in, uh, most of the bats have already mated. So we have mostly pre uh, pregnant females. So you're looking at around 500 bats per square foot. So an example of that would be like a sheet of notebook paper space 
you have hundreds of bats hanging from that small space that on a sheet of notebook paper. Amazing. So, <clears throat> so that's how thick the bats are uh, on the walls of the cave. Uh, when they're um, dropping off of the ceiling of the cave to fly around, you'll get this vortex we call the bat nado, uh, which fill, literally fills the bowl of the sinkhole behind me. And then when they get up to treetop level, they, they start streaming away in this river of bats. And they stay together like that for a few thousand yards. Uh, it's kind of protection against predators because we have a lot of predators in the area that will take advantage of uh, these bats to, to feed on them. So they stay, it's like schooling fish. So they stay together in these tight uh, streams of bats in the sky. You mentioned that Bracken Cave is, is utilized by female bats uh, for the reproductive success. So how does that work? It seems like it's a, it's a colony of, it's, it's a maternal colony, essentially. Is that correct? We're, yeah, so it's a maternity roost uh, early. We do have some males in the, bat, in the cave as well. But the majority of the bats are uh, are females that are uh, pregnant, and their gestation period is only about 90 days. Okay. So sometime in early June, we'll start having babies. Um, they have one baby bat each. A baby bat's called a pup. So when that baby is born, um, it, it climbs up on the mother's chest and hangs on because for the first week, 10 days, the baby is hanging on to the mother's chest while she's out foraging for food. So it has to hang on really tight. And then after about a week, 10 days, the babies start getting pretty big because uh, the mothers are generating their body weight in milk every day for their young. Wow. And uh, so they move the baby from clinging to her because the, now it is too heavy for her to carry to these nursery sections in the cave. There's about four spots on the ceiling of the cave where they stick the baby bats. Uh, they're still too young to fly, but they can crawl around. And so that in those spots is really cool because it's, the ceiling is pink uh, because the bats are still hairless. So you have all these millions of hairless baby bats on the ceiling of the cave. And one of the really cool things is <clears throat> the mothers only nurse their baby. And she has to find her baby amongst all those other millions of baby bats you know so you got 500 bats per square foot and only one of those <clears throat> the mother the, her mother is kind of fine and so she does that with two ways so she spatially remembers more or less where the baby was left last time she nursed it but the babies do move around so she'll fly over near that area and call out to her baby and the baby will call back and so she can kind of triangulate where the baby is and get really close and literally they land on the mats of babies and sniff around till they find their baby and that's the only one they're going to nurse oh amazing yeah i had a, i actually my next question was about that uh you know because at first glance it seems like an impossible task of uh, hundreds of bats per square foot and scientists once speculated that maybe they mexican free tail bat moms just kind of nursed pups at random. Uh, but I think that says more about our inability to sort of imagine how other animals have solved these problems than it does uh, about the the uh, abilities of, of bats. Um, and then how long are uh, bat pups in the cave? Eventually, they're going to start to take, uh, you know, flights out of the cave, you know, with with their mother. Um, so what's that? What, what's that process like? Yeah. So for about <clears throat> for they're, when they're about five weeks old, they start flying. And then when they're about eight weeks, nine weeks old is when they're, the mothers wean them. So uh, during that first period, where a first week or so, when they just started flying, the mothers will still nurse them uh, to kind of supplement their diet while they're learning how to catch bugs for, bugs for dinner. Um, but if you can imagine, if you're a baby bat and, and, the, and to kind of get a description of inside the cave, um, the cave itself is 650 feet long. It's 117 feet floor to ceiling and about 124 feet wide inside the cave. So if you're a baby bat, you're sitting up there, you're 117 feet off the floor of the cave and it's time to learn how to fly. Uh, you, you let go and you have 117 feet to get the, get your wings flapping and you know, you're echolocating. You're also learning. You can see where you're going as well. 
and everybody flies in the same counterclockwise direction uh, so they don't bump go, bump into each other head on. And, uh, and that's kind of their, they come out into the sinkhole and then they fly off downrange. And, you know, that's their, their first night out. They also uh, seem to possess a, a suite of adaptations to help them survive in spaces with thousands to millions of their neighbors, essentially. Uh, the, you know, ammonia, I think, can build up in, in caves because mm-hmm. of the, the guano and the urine the, that bats excrete. There's parasite uh, exposure. Um, those are maybe just a couple of hazards created by high densities of bats and caves. And they also have to thermoregulate while shoved against each other. And I think anybody, any one of us who's ever been in like a big crowd of people on a warm day knows that it can be pretty difficult to maybe regulate our own body temperatures when you're just walled in next to um, a, a lot of neighbors. Uh, so how, how do bats deal with those hazards and challenges uh, that are basically just a product of living in close proximity of, of you know, thousands of other bats? Well, the Mexican free tail bats, they like a very hot roost. So okay. right now the temperatures and, and, and you can kind of think of the cave as like a giant incubator right now. So it's 104 degrees inside the cave right now. So uh, so they like that hot, hot environment to start off with. Uh, the ammonia and methane and CO2, those other those gases are heavier gases. So they do concentrate down near the floor. So the bats are uh, about a, a hundred and some odd feet away from them. Uh, but they also have adapted the metabolism and everything has adapted to that type of environment over mil- millions of years. I mean, bats have been around for 52 million years. So they've adapted the, to this kind of environment. And it also keeps the predators out of the cave. So they, they, they only have to worry about the predators out here uh, when they come out to, to forage for food. And so those, uh, those com- combination of those adaptations, uh, as far as heat goes, um, Mexican free tail bats are pretty cool on their sides, um, kind of like up where our under our armpits would be. They kind of like have a bare spot, and the veins are really close to the surface, so it almost acts like a like a radiator oh, uh, to okay. to help cool them down themselves down. So, uh, so they've adapted to this kind of hot environment. That's one of the reasons they like the bridges as a roost, uh, because you figure that sun is baking that hot concrete bridge all day long so they 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 like these hot hot environments to uh to roost in any space containing millions of animals though is is going to develop its own sort of ecology uh so i did have a couple Mm -hmm. of questions about that Um, you know not all bat pups survive for example um so if one falls from the cave ceiling what hazards does it face on the ground? I think falling from the ceiling for a bat pup is essentially a death sentence. Uh, but there are animals in the cave that are waiting for that opportunity to feed. Right. I mean, caves have their own little ecosystem and bat caves have an even more dynamic ecosystem. And so one of the interesting things that's in really crazy, uh, neat things on the floor of the cave is in these big uh, Mexican free tail colonies, we have dermestid flesh-eating beetles. So when you look at the floor of the cave, it just literally is moving. Uh, oh, there's wow. beetles okay. are so thick on the floor of the cave. And, that you know, that's basically housekeeping. They, when if a bat falls on the floor of the cave, he, uh, you know, dying from old age or, or is injured or whatnot, those beetles will just basically eat the bat to the bone. And they also eat the bat guano as well. Uh, so the, they just basically consume everything that lands on the floor of the cave. Earlier, you mentioned predators, too, uh, that maybe are attracted to the cave entrance to feed on bats as they fly in and out. Uh, so what other wildlife is attracted to the cave because of the bats? Right. So when you're watching uh, emergence on our cameras, you'll get to see uh, in the sky overhead, we have a number of different species of raptors. Oh, for example, right now we can have anywhere from eight to 12 uh, hawks, uh, our Swainson's hawks, red shoulders hawks, red tail hawks, peregrine falcons um, are the ones we see the most of uh, right now. So we can have any, you know, like five, six pairs of hawks catching bats overhead at night. Um, they're the entrance of the cave. 
the bats when they're emerging, that vortex, the bat NATO is within inches of the ground. So it's really easy for predators to catch bats as well. And since the bats only weigh 15 grams, so if you think about 15 grams, that's two quarters, 50 cents is how much one of these bats weigh. So like today, it's really windy out here. So any little gust of wind can actually knock the bats down on the ground sometimes. And that's when our predators will take advantage of that situation. And we have uh, our large snakes, like our Texas rat snake, our diamondback rattlesnakes, and our coach whip snakes, which is one of the fastest snakes in North America. They all hang out near the entrance of the cave to catch bats uh, that may end up on the ground. And then we also have raccoons, skunks, ringtails, um, fox, great, and uh, um, coyotes as well. So they'll take advantage of this concentration of, of, of smaller mammals for to eat in the evenings. People, too, have taken advantage of uh, bat caves in mm -hmm. the past because bats defecate a lot. Uh, so not unlike people and their waste accumulates over time. In, in some places like uh, Carlsbad Cavern, before it became protected as a national park, guano mining was a major industry there. I, I was curious to know if, if Bracken Cave has ever been subjected to guano mining in the past, and, and did that industry affect bats? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> yeah, they started mining the guano out of Bracken Cave in the, around the mid-1800s. Uh, it was originally harvested as a fertilizer. It's uh, uh, very high in nitrates. And that all, because it's also high in nitrates, that nitrate <clears throat> is a component of gunpowder. So it was a, a, during since the during the Civil War era, it was used for gunpowder production. Uh, so those two things, as a fertilizer and for gunpowder production, um, is what the guano was used for. Um, um, pretty much all the way through into the two thousands. Oh, I didn't know it was happening that recently. Okay, very interesting. And, uh, you know, we, we, bat caves are, are, are sensitive uh, environments for bats. Uh, you know, a lot of times the best thing to do is just to leave those places undisturbed for the bats to do the thing inside. Uh, a more recent and, and maybe devastating threat to colonial bat species in North America is white-nosed syndrome. Uh, that's a fungal disease that likely originated in Europe. It was uh, first detected in New York State and has spread across most of the United States. And it, it's killed perhaps hundreds of millions of bats, especially among those that, that hibernate. Uh, I, one statistic I found said in the Northeast US, the populations of hibernating bats have declined about 75% in recent years. Uh, Mexican free tail bats don't hibernate, although they do, do live in dense colonies, which seems like it would be uh, a, a place where uh, diseases could transmit easily from one bat to the next. Um, so one of our audience members was asking uh, about if white nose syndrome has been found in Bracken Cave. And I, a follow-up question that I have to that is, is how susceptible are Mexican free tail bats to white, white nose syndrome? So the, uh, the, the, there's a fungus that causes white nose syndrome, pseudomyosin destructions. We call it PD for short. Now, so you have this fungus that's in the environment. <clears throat> so there's a difference between having the fungus and having the disease. So, okay. um, Bracken Cave has the fungus. We uh, discovered the fungus in 2017 here in Texas. Um, the But we don't have the disease in Bracken Cave. And having the disease means there's so much fungus um, that it starts eating. You know, and, and the fungus is lethal to our hibernating bats because it eats into their skin and while, uh, during, during the winter months while they're trying to hibernate and live off these uh, finite fat reserves that they have. And that irritant um, disturbs that hibernation cycle and the bats end up starving to death um, before the winter's over. <clears throat> so that's the disease. And we, we don't have that, we don't have the disease in, in Bracken Cave. And since our bats are migratory, <clears throat> they're leaving this space and going somewhere where it's warmer and there's food to forage on. Uh, they're not impacted uh, by the disease. But we do have other species of bats in the area, like our cave myotis and our tricolor bats, that do hibernate and are being impacted by the disease in other caves. 
But I guess some good news and some bad news there associated with white nose syndrome. Um, hopefully, you know, our, our bat populations elsewhere in North America are on the, in the process of recovering from essentially what has been a devastating plague for them. Um, it, it's it's remarkable to see what like a healthy bat colony looks like, though, when we watch the, when I watch the cameras at Bracken Cave, Fran, uh, they're, you know, the, the bat, the Mexican free tail bats are primarily nocturnal and they, they leave these roosts uh, at sunset uh, at sunset um, for these nightly hunts. And it, it's not a trickle of bats, as we can see in this clip. It's what you described as a bat NATO. So what's that experience like, you know, being there in the evening? for the bat flight at Bracken Cave in person. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, some people consider it's almost spiritual to be sitting here. It's nice and quiet. We've got the crickets chirping, the birds chirping. Uh, so this, this is a beautiful space. And then you'll what you'll see first is when you look down into the entrance to the cave, into, into the bowels of the earth, as they say, into the darkness, it almost looks like the air is moving inside the cave. And that's literally the vortex of bats just inside the mouth of the cave as they swirling around and queuing up for before they start coming out. Uh, and then that vortex moves to the mouth of, to the cave and, and pokes its way out into the bottom of the sinkhole. And so at that first lap out, literally they come out halfway and they're going back in. And then once they're out into the bottom of the sinkhole, it takes them about six or seven rotations, laps, to get up high enough to clear these trees. And uh, so while they're doing that, um, the sound is, if, if you can imagine, when, if you put your hair, ear to a hot tin roof during a rainstorm, that loud almost like it's not deafening but this is loud roar of the wing beats of all these bats as they come out of the cave at the same time we actually can feel a breeze from the vortex as well um as they as they the swirl in this mass in front of us so it's a pretty amazing and spectacular thing to see and i do in have fact, a if you go, yeah and mike if you go to our website we actually have a recordings that you can download of the bats exiting the cave, that sound of their wing beats as, and when they exit the cave. And we also have the sound as when they return, which is a completely different experience. Well, yeah, I, that sounds, that sounds amazing. Uh, certainly um, it's an, it, it's a, it's a wonderful experience just to see on the cameras, the density of, of the bats really is sort of one of those enthralling, nightly events that we get to watch on, on explore.org. And I have a few uh, questions for you, Fran, before we conclude, but, but before we get to that, I want to um, get to some more audience questions. We have a couple that are maybe just general back questions. And then a couple that are also maybe about uh, myths uh, associated with bats. And there never seems to be any shortage of those, unfortunately. Um, somebody was actually wondering just a general back question. What is the biggest bat in the world? So the largest bat we have in the world is the, what they call the golden crown flying fox. And if I could, I'll step back. His wingspan is as wide as think, my fingertip to fingertip. Amazing. So kind of think of a uh, wiener dog with wings. <laughs> so you have this you have the fruit bat and has a golden crown flying fox has a six foot wingspan. So it's pretty amazing. But they eat fruit. Another question we have from our audience is uh, maybe I think this one is perhaps about how do how do bats adapt to changes in their their roosting environment? So somebody was wondering what happens when a cave caves in on bats? I mean, I guess that could potentially happen. But what yeah, what happens if a, a bat population happens to maybe lose their their roosting habitat, the thing that they're depending on either for like reproduction or maybe just like to survive um, the daytime? <clears throat> well, there I mean. So if, for example, for, if something happened to where they couldn't get back into the cave in the morning when they come to return, they're going to end up in trees and, and uh, any old structures in the area or something like that. So they're going to they're going to uh, bridges. They'll hunker down somewhere to uh, to uh, to get out of the get out of the weather or get out of the sun. 
until that next night where they can find another place to roost. We had that happens a lot um, in July when the juveniles are flying and they're out foraging for food. Uh, they're not as strong as the adults, and sometimes they get tired when they're out. And you know, we in the, some of the neighborhoods in the area, and uh, we get calls from somebody walks out to get their newspaper in the morning, and uh, they've got a few hundred bats uh, under their porch. But so those are usually juveniles that they just were tired and checked in at the neighborhood porch to. Uh, spend the day and then that rest and that evening they'll they take take off and come back to the cave so but they'll they'll end up finding another another roost to uh to get into um but that is a loss of habitat uh worldwide is a big big issue for bat species all over the world and with one question that uh is that we, or one part of their uh their daily activities that we didn't talk about is like their trigger to leave the cave uh you know the a cave like bracken is is big enough and, and deep enough that it would have a dark zone so they wouldn't be exposed uh to changes in daylight uh maybe deep down in their roosting areas so somebody was wondering if they're farther back in the cave what's the trigger for bats to emerge each evening yeah, we're not 100% sure what that trigger is. They've got their own internal circadian rhythm that they use to, to regulate what they're doing. But part of what the, for this maternity roost is um, the how, how abundant food, the availability of food, and um, the uh, how hungry the, the female is. So you can figure these, these are nursing females or pregnant then nursing females. They had to eat a lot of food. So they're literally eating their body weight in bugs every night. So uh, they have to be out long enough to be able to do that. So, uh, for example, this time of year right now, we've got a lot of rain so far. We're still in a drought, but we've gotten a lot of rain. Things are nice and green. There's a lot of vegetation. It means there's a lot of insects. There's a lot of food. The bats are coming out around almost 8 p.m. If we're in a severe drought, and especially our when our crops are being impacted by a severe drought and they're not growing like they normally would, that means there's not a lot of insects on those crops. So the bats have to adjust their behavior and, and be actually come out earlier to be out long enough to get enough to eat to uh, to feed their to be able to generate enough milk to feed their young. So in some cases during the summer months, instead of coming out at eight o'clock. Um, when there's a, a lot of food available, they may be coming out at 7 p.m. So you have an hour and a half of daylight. So they're risking predation um, to be able to get out, uh, to get enough food, to generate enough milk to, to feed their young. A couple of questions, uh, again, about bat myths. Um, somebody was wondering, why are bats blamed for disease. And we certainly know that bats, as like all, all mammals can carry rabies, but then just during the, you know, the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was almost like a bat phobia spreading across the world, unfortunately. So yeah, why why is that? Why are why are bats blamed for for disease? Well, part of it is because we don't know a lot about bats and um what's going on with bats or metabolism. And, and and where they're roosting and that time. So a lack of information is, uh, about the bats in certain areas is generating um, this this misinformation. So, I mean, bats did not ca uh, cause COVID-19. Um, it's the same way with when you talk about rabies, bats aren't carriers of rabies. If they get rabies, they die. Uh, so they're... they're um, so that's part of it. a lot of it is just the lack of information uh, and because there hasn't been enough research done to understand um, what's going on with the bats that we have all over the world. And one more uh, myth related question about bats. Somebody was wondering, do bats ever attack humans? No, I mean, no, I mean, none of us look like a bug. So there's no reason for bats to attack us um, in any any for any reason. Um, I've been working with bats for over 20 years, and I, you know I'm going into their roost, 
and they're not they're not attacking me um, in any way, shape, or form. They 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 don't want to be near us. They don't be, want to be around it. They're just like any other wild animal. So the uh, the biggest thing is just to stay out of their habitat, and then you you won't have to worry about encountering bats. But bats are not. It's not. It's not Hollywood. It's not like flying, <laughs> what you see on the movies, the horror movies. They're not flying around looking for someone to attack. Um, there's only, you know, out of over 1,400 species of bats, there's only three species where blood is their food. The vampire bats we have down in Central America. And out of those three species, only one of them is mammal. So, uh, but, you know, there the other bats have picked up the bad rap because of one species of bat that uh, blood is their food, which is not humans, is it? It's mostly it's wild animals mm-hmm. out in the environment that the, these bats are living in. It's when we move into their environment and their homes that uh, these and you could get these negative uh, impacts. And with the the few minutes rela- remaining in our conversation, uh, I just have a few more questions for you, uh, Fran. Mm-hmm. Uh, the bat flights at Bracken Cave uh, right now uh, in April, or there's, they seem to be starting to increase in size and duration. So what can we expect to see on the cams at Bracken Cave as we enter late spring and summer? Well, now, uh, as we get later in the season and, and more and more of our bats are, will be back, uh, by the time we get into uh, early May, uh, our, our colony is uh, back. We'll have eight to ten pregnant females. So you're going to just see these swarms and swarms of bats. Uh, As it warms up, you'll start seeing more snakes and other predators down near the entrance of the caves. Um, And then in June, uh, the females will start having their babies. We won't see anything right away with that. But come July, about five weeks later, uh, when the babies start flying, uh, we'll have even more bats flying. And uh, one of the cool things is, for the first two weeks, when the juveniles start flying, a lot of them move to the entrance of the cave because it gets pretty crowded in the cave. Um, and so we literally can see the baby bats, juvenile bats, which really can't tell the difference between the juveniles and the young unless you're holding them side by side because they're all the mm-hmm. same size by then. But you'll they'll literally be right at the entrance to the cave. So we'll have the cameras trained on them so you'll be able to see them. Uh, during the day, well, I'm looking forward to forward to that for sure. And right, uh, and then also, Mike, one of the cool things is in the morning. So for those of you guys that uh, get up early in the morning, once we get into start getting into later early summer, uh, sunrise will be around 6 a.m. The bats are returning at that time, so you'll literally be able to see the bats coming back in. Right now, they're coming in. 6 a.m. is still dark, so it's really hard to see what's going on. But early in the mornings um, and during the summer months, uh, you'll li- it literally rains bats uh, into the sinkhole and into the entrance. Okay, so you'll be able to see that on the cameras as well. You were also uh, in the path of totality for the April 8 eclipse. Were you able to enjoy it from uh, back Bracken Cave or uh, were you at a different location? Uh, we were here at Bracken Cave monitoring what the bats would be doing. Um, we only had two bats come out during the uh, totality. Uh, everybody else slept in. Um, so it was really cloudy. So the uh, seeing the actual eclipse itself um, w- was a little bit of a bummer because it was so cloudy. But uh, we did have two bats uh, come out and uh, circle around and then went back into caves. And there was uh, nothing nothing going else going on. Okay. <laughs> Those two bats are like, oh, yeah, we got this wrong. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and just one one final question for you. Um, how can we make s- space for for bats in our communities and in in our neighborhoods? Again, they are <laughs> sort of an unfairly maligned uh, group of animals, um, but they provide us with a lot of benefits, and they're just uh, fascinating creatures in their own right that deserve space to exist. So, what are you, what is your advice for making space for bats in our neighborhoods? Well, I think one of the big things is. To remember all over the world if if we're protecting habitat that bats need and there's water there's roosting space there's food all the other species in that area whether it's insects whether it's birds uh, other small mammals 
all of them will benefit from that same habitat. So the, I think the biggest thing is is protecting the green space that we have left, um, either through conservation easements, parks, whatever we can do to protect the green spaces that we have throughout the world. On a small scale, we can put in bat gardens and pollinator gardens in our backyards uh, to you know help the birds and the bats as well. Uh, and and the, the, so that green space, and we benefit from it too. I mean, green space is, is a great, great place to go and just to calm down and, uh, and be with yourself in a, some quiet space to get kind of get out of the rat race of daily living. Well, I think that's a great note to end our conversation on. Uh, I know we didn't get to all of our audience questions, but I do appreciate all the questions that were submitted today. And Fran, I want to thank you again for taking the time to to join us here on Explore.org. It was a great conversation and, and we should do it again sometime. No, great. Well, thanks for everybody for coming. And like I said, we'll see you at the Bat Cave. And my uh, guest today was Fran Hutchins, who is the director of the Bracken Cave Preserve with Bat Conservation International. If you want to learn more about their work and the site itself, you can always go to batcon.org. And of course, if you want to watch the bats, you can do that this evening. They're going to be coming out of the cave within the next couple of hours or so. Go to explore.org slash bats. Check it out. Really cool to see. Bats are, uh, again, unfairly maligned and misunderstood, but they are remarkable, highly evolved creatures. They play a vital role in our world, and we have a glimpse into their lives by watching them on the webcams. So thanks for everyone who watched today. Thanks for everyone who submitted their questions. Again, thanks to Fran Hutchins. And my name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. We'll be talking to you again with more live chats coming up uh, this spring. And until then, I'll talk. Uh, enjoy your evening and I'll talk to you later.